Boom. We're live. What's up, everybody? Happy Wednesday night. It is time for Bookkeeping Beer and BS. I got my guy, Adam Phillips, in the house. Uh, Adam is just starting out a pressure washing business, but it's not his first business. So uh, he's no stranger to the entrepreneurship space. That said, uh, he also realizes the importance of doing some finance stuff and nerding out with me a little bit on building the budget for kind of his first year in business. I got to give a shout out to my guy, Aaron Parker, Lean and Mean Academy. Um, Aaron and I built this budget template together, Adam, that you and I are going to go over. So it's kind of built for the, the solo operator that's scaling up and trying to maximize profits early on. Uh, awesome. so I think that's a We've got a whole lot of budget templates out of there. So I'll give my shameless plug for that quick. You go to yourblueskies.com, whether you're home cleaning, window cleaning, pressure washing, junk removal, pest control, there's a budget out there for pretty much every home service industry. It's not just like, oh, here's your budget template for you to fill out. It actually has all the percentages of every line item in your P&L, how much you should spend on that line item as a percent of revenue. So literally all you need to do as a business owner is punch in your revenue by month and it spits out a budget for you that easy there's a ton of customization you can do to it it has a ton of flexibility and that's why adam and i are going to do that for his business tonight and kind of mess around with those inputs so whatever industry you're in adam and i are going to be talking about pressure washing tonight but any service industry the same stuff applies we all do the same thing we trade labor and a little bit of expertise for dollars in our bank account and we do that as many times and as efficiently as possible to grow that bank account as big as we can um, and scale it to whatever size we want. So what, no, like I said, no matter what industry you're in, this, this format, this formula works the same. Go out to yourblueskies.com, get your target budget sheet. Tonight, we're doing like a special budget that I don't even have on my website. I don't give this budget sheet away because Aaron Parker and I collaborated on it. I don't want just anybody to have it. If you're gonna download this one, it's only because you watch this video. I'm gonna put it in the comments actually, so that if you want this specific budget template, um, you can go get this specific one, but you gotta know the link. You can't just go to the website. It is your blueskies.com slash lean and mean. And now it's in the comments, if you really wanna go get it. Um, so Adam, what's going on my man? Happy Wednesday night, buddy. Happy Wednesday. Thank you so much for having me. I, uh, just so everybody knows, this was Adam's idea. Well, maybe not. I don't remember whose idea it was. Yeah. Um, but, but, uh, I always appreciate when people are like, Hey, let's do this thing. And yeah, let's do it live so that everybody gets the benefit of going through the exercise, not just you and I, uh, Heck yeah, man. uh, this, this channel literally exists because bookkeeping and budgeting can be so damn boring if it's not done by the right people in the right way. And that's why, uh, A, sometimes we have a beer while we do it because that, you know, it's like bowling. You got to have, you know, be at that like three beer level to be really, really honed in at it. Um, of course, yeah. And uh, the cool thing about bookkeeping and finances in general is that it's really how your business makes money. And the better we can be at it, the more money we put in our pockets. And that's literally why we got into business. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't get into business just to go spray water around. We got in business to put money into our bank account. So that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to talk about. I am going to jump on to the Zoom thing on my phone, do a little share action so that uh, some of the folks out there can see it. Boom. Oh, it's already shared out there. You, you shared it a few times. Okay. Without space. Yeah, I think I did share it to a couple of people. So. All right. All right. Well, let's do this thing. So, Adam, can you, uh, can you paint a little background picture so people can kind of, uh, see where you're coming from, hear your side of the story and get some background info on you? Yeah, man. So I guess the quick and dirty is um, I did 10 years in the military. And when I, I just was deciding on getting out, my wife and I decided to open a fitness studio. And we went in together all in. I mean, we're talking a couple hundred thousand dollars and ran that from about the end of 2018 all the way up until about mid 2020. Um, we ended up actually selling the studio, quote unquote, selling, losing the studio um, in September of uh, 2020. Um, but what happened is when the state of South Carolina did a mandatory shutdown, my wife looked at me and she was furloughed from work and said, how the heck are we going to pay our bills? 
during coronavirus. And I said, well, my buddy makes a bunch of money spraying water on, pe on, on people's houses down in Nashville. So maybe I could do the same. And she goes, well, let's go buy you a pressure washer. So, you know, let's get out there. we went and bought a pressure washer. And, you know, um, crazy thing is, man, is um, that same day, our AC unit on the house went out. The day she got furloughed, the day our studio closed is the day that our AC unit on our house went out and it was 83 degrees outside and 110% humidity here in South Carolina. So that's, we, that's, uh, that's intense. Yeah. So we were like, well, I guess we better go make some money so we can uh, buy a new AC unit. And fast forward about three weeks from then, we actually saved, made enough money just from pressure washing, posting on next door, posting on Facebook, things like that to where we were able to pay cash for a guy to come in and install an AC unit for us. Um, and we learned that we can make some decent money doing this, um, but also help people. And that's kind of what I've always done. I've always been in the business of helping people. So I have a passion for it. And I, you know, I also get something out of seeing a really dirty property and making it really clean. It's something that I really enjoy doing. It's very, um, I guess, Zen, you know, more or less. So it's cathartic, just just like taking something from bad to good, and how fast it can be done, and how like how much better it can look. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, you get that sense of pride. I was, Definitely. Quick, quick tangent. I was trying. Uh, so there's there's like a moral of that story, where like the dirtier something is, and the more like stops you got to pull out to clean it, kind of the more proud you feel about it. And Definitely. I was in our in some of our businesses we've had a hard time with employees like getting depressed and having just you know like general anxiety issues but but even more so just like not being able to overcome kind of small things sometimes and i i came up with uh, the realization that it, it has it's got to have something to do with like the uh i'm 35 i grew up in the age of everybody starting to get a medal for everything Mm -hmm. and and like being given things instead of having to earn things and there's definitely a, a a assimilation there where it's like uh business owners take so much pride in doing really hard things and we're running into some employees that can't that never learned how to do really hard things and that that you yeah. know like getting something there's no pride in getting anything mm -hmm. um but everybody will take a handout uh but business owners have the, I don't know if it's the curse or the blessing that yeah. we understand the benefit of hard work. And when something gets really hard, we can associate that with like the payoff is going to be awesome. I'm going to feel really good when mm -hmm. I get this done. The dirtier the house is, the more proud of it I'm going to be. Whereas there's unfortunate uh, members of society that just don't have that. Like uh, I'd say it is a blessing like to, to take the pride in the work that you do. And man, if you're just used to getting everything, like you just, there's just no pride in it. And pride is what makes you tick. So I feel, I feel you about cleaning things and seeing that work that you do uh, as a business owner. It's all about building it. Once, once it's built, like it starts to get boring. Um, yeah. That next challenge. So you got a big challenge in front of you because you're kind of starting from the ground up. Um, exactly. So, so you had the gym. You started pressure washing. You started putting cash in the bank, and now you're taking it. What? Uh, that's kind of where you're at today. I was on a Zoom call with you a couple of weeks ago, and you had a pressure washer. Was it in the back seat or the trunk? It is actually in the trunk of my car. So yeah, yeah. So you are you are like the lean and mean. You're making as much money as possible when you go out to clean. Um, I'm sure that's not your grand vision of the setup that you're eventually trying to get, <laughs> but like. You're not wasting any time making money. And I love that because so many people are like, what, what should I get? What setup should I have? And it's like, just go buy a fucking pressure washer and spray some water around. Like, it's really not rocket science. Do it yeah. as cost effectively as possible to put as much money in your pocket right away as possible. Then worry about what you're going to get with it. Don't yeah. start with what you're going to get. Um, so, so paint the picture of what you're working with now and then like transition that to where you're trying to go in the next year or two, like what's the, what's the short term vision? Okay. Of yeah. So as I was saying, you know, we, we didn't, I mean, everything for us was, was done. So we, we basically went to home Depot and bought the cheapest thing we could. We bought a Ryobi 2.5 gallon per minute and 3000 PSI. And the only reason I bought it is because it could fold up and fit in the back seat of my car. And that's, that's what we started with. <laughs> um, but 
long story short, we figured out that it got the seats dirty. So first thing I did is I took the seats out. And uh, now I don't have any seats in the back of my Nissan Altima. Um, and then after about, you know, maybe 120 houses or so, my buddy's like, dude, you know, this would be a lot easier if you had a bigger machine. And I'm like, cool. Like, how do I go about getting one? He goes, I'll sell you mine. And his was used for about a year and a half. And this is a 5.5 gallon a minute um, Honda GX390. And it's, uh, I think, 4,000 PSI. I'm like, that won't fit in my car. He goes, yeah, well, man, we'll just put it in your trunk and just take out your trunk. Okay, so we took out the trunk as well, the carpet, the padding, everything. It fits with about this much clearance. Just That's enough perfect. Then it, then it doesn't even rattle around that much. Exactly, man. So it's just enough. To, in fact, the rubber pads don't even go underneath it. So when it's when it's running, you hear go, 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 go on the metal in the back of the car. Um, but um, it's definitely been a learning curve because we put a 35 gallon holding tank for water in the back plus a surfactant tank. And every now and then it, you know, pipes bust off, floods the car, whatever. Um, but it gets the job done. And, you know, talking to a few people in these different communities and stuff for pressure washing, they're like, why would you do that? Why don't you go buy a truck and this, that, and the other? And I'm like, look guys, like I, you know, my story, I, I we, we lost $300,000 on our fitness business. Like, I can't just go to the bank and say, hey, lend me another 60 for a truck or another 30 for a truck when I'm in debt, you know, a lot of money. So I told him, I said, once I can pay cash for a car after I'm debt free, then I'll go buy a truck. And that's kind of why, you know, I approached you is because I wanted to have those steps to get there. And my first step, which I, I think we kind of talked about was growing and where do I, how do I want to grow to that? So I already bought the hitch. I just got a trailer. And I'm about to do a little setup in the, a trailer that my car will be able to pull so I can put the back seat back in my car. <laughs> Maybe, I mean, you, you got any kids? How many kids you got? We don't have any kids. Um, we actually don't plan on having any kids either. And you, so, and you hardly even need a back seat. What the hell's the back seat for anyway? <laughs> well, you know, I do have a dog that we love to take to the beach and got to put her in my car because we can't put her in the wife's car. So, yeah. Well, I mean, like, the dog probably would even, you know, like a sheet of plywood back there in a dog bed. Like seats are just, you know, getting in the way of a dog sticking their head out the window anyway. It already has a piece of plywood back there because that's what holds up the 35 gallon water tank. So there you go. That's perfect. That's perfect. So, you know, um, seats or no <laughs> seats, I still like the trailer idea. But it, but to that point, and we'll start building out the budget here. I think um, as business owners, we tend to get hung up on the toys. Of and course. Yeah. I, I try to always uh, stress the importance of the fact that our, our machines don't make us money. We get some more productivity out of it, but the only thing that really is an, a true investment in our business is marketing to fill up our schedule mm -hmm. and then the labor to do the work. And right now you're the labor. Someday you might not be the labor. Um, there's, there's incremental gains we can make with equipment but it comes at the cost of the equipment and, and they pay for themselves slowly over time, Correct. slower than the marketing usually pays for itself. Of course. Um, and so I think it's, it's, you're doing it out of necessity, but I also think you're doing it really intelligently in the way you're scaling it up. The, the equipment has to be able to pay for itself and you are letting the equipment that you have make the money to pay for its own replacement. Of course. And you know, great. In the beginning, I went to my wife and was like, look, this is what my friend's rig looks like. I need just $16,000. Just give it to me. And she's like, not until you can show me that you can make $16,000. And, you know, and that's kind of what it's gotten to is slowly growing. And I think that's why I, I talked to you is now I want to do a trailer for this whole summer. Right. And at least get the hose reels hooked up because right now I still reel it up by hand. That takes 30 minutes per job, you know. Yeah. Um, which we kind of talked about. And I, I think we're going to go over here later, but ultimately I do want to get to a truck or I want to get to a bigger trailer with an SUV that I can pull, uh, you know, a, a good rig setup in. But mm -hmm. I know from past experience with different businesses, you know, I owned a haunted house business 16 years, um, the fitness studio, like everything I've ever done, you got to spend more money on marketing because you're not going to get business by just having expensive nice looking equipment a thirty thousand dollar rig in the back seat of your car you know what i mean so and I, like i said i bought my rig used it was 900 bucks and it was normally like a 1900 dollar unit so i mean and it works just fine <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah the, the customers just like that their stuff is clean um the uh kevin chapman had a good comment he's a 
buddy of mine that's local here in Minneapolis does the same, you know, window cleaning, pressure washing type of stuff. He said personal preference versus investment. And I think Correct. we can get caught up in uh, explaining away a personal preference as an investment. Like it's the thing that I want, but because I want to justify it, I'll call it an investment. Um, so a lot of guys get sucked into that trap. Um, but let's, uh, let's dive into the budget. You got anything before we start sharing spreadsheets and getting really nerdy, anything, you know, we talk about the, rigging up the trailer and getting that set up any, uh, financial things that are running through your mind. Like, should we do this? Should we not do this just so we can set the stage and, and make sure we're hitting all the targets? Um, not really. I mean, like, I, um, the biggest thing is, I think we kind of talked about this offline, but just like, I don't know what my monthly target should be, you know, and I know the lean and mean has a really good number to kind of start at. And I would love to get the, to that number. So, I mean, we, we can definitely start there, but my biggest thing, man, is to be able to at least double what my full-time income is at my job, because then I know that, okay, look, this is actually a valuable option, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's being able to pay myself that, not just being able to have that as a gross revenue. So that's yep. something yep. that I know we'll kind of get into, so. Gotcha. Um, one question jumped in here. Should you do lines of business credit? I, uh, well, that'll be interesting if we get to that going through your stuff. So, so should you do a line of credit? Um, if you can make the money back, I, as a business owner, leverage is a friend of ours, like as a, as a individual Dave Ramsey, you know, preaches like not to have that sort of debt as a business owner, debt is okay. As long as you're investing the debt into something that gets you a return. There you go. So, so I love Dave Ramsey and I love that mentality as a person, as an individual, it doesn't make sense to have a lot of debt because most individuals don't own a business that generates a 20 to 40% return. Correct. We do. Um, and therefore borrowing money and reinvesting it in things that make more money. I, I always like to say rich people don't get rich because they work harder. Rich people get rich because they're really good at using their money to make more money. One of the ways you use, one of the ways you make more money is by using other people's money to make your money, which that's why you borrow money is then it's not your money tied up. You're using somebody else's money to make you even more money and you can do it so much faster. Now, clearly that can get out of control. Clearly that's not for everybody, but it, there is some simple math about the interest rate that you can borrow at and how much money your business returns. And if you can borrow at a low interest rate and reinvest at a higher interest rate in your marketing, that will make you more money over time. You still have to be smart about it. You still have to be responsible about it. The line of credits aren't always the best way to do it. They're not the lowest interest rate you can get. Um, so be careful with of, those 0% in introductory ones too, because that's what we did when we started our fitness studio is they're like, look, you'll have it paid off in 12 months and 12 months didn't come around. And I was say, the payments are massive. Like they, they strap you with, if you're, if you're trying to pay any debt in 12 months, the payments are just going to be way too big to, to make it work. Yep. Just be careful. That's all I got to say. We, we had 16 different lines of credit for our fitness studio and they all came due at the same time after, you know, 14 to 16 months. And our payments went from like 60 bucks a month to $460 a month. And we're like, whoa. And our business, I mean, we were making 18 to 20 K a month, but our, our credit card payments alone were $7,000. And that's not in a, in a position you want to be in. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the debt has to make its money back faster than the interest accrues and Correct. faster than the, than the payables come due. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's a risk and reward uh, situation with that. I'm not a huge fan of lines of credit because it tends to be just a drug and you keep going back to it. Um, if, if there's a loan that you need for an asset that, you know, be, like you have the marketing, you have the people to do it and you just need this asset to go clean it. I like financing that sort of stuff. I don't like having a line of credit for the sake of just like covering operating expenses. Yeah. You need a credit card or line of credit to borrow against to cover operating expenses. It means that your business isn't making enough money to pay your operating expenses. And then your business model is just in trouble. And the interest rate on those things is usually 10 to 20%. Most businesses hardly earn 10 to 20%. So you literally, there's no way you could pay it off. Like yeah. your business doesn't, doesn't make enough of a return to pay off that kind of interest rate. So anyway, tangent, 
I get distracted easily. Let's no. uh, let's do. A, I think I think that's a good one though. I like that that debt question, especially like as you're starting up, and that's why I really appreciate how you're like bootstrapping stuff because it's tempting to just like go borrow a bunch of money to get all the big stuff, but it never pays itself back fast enough. You got to like let the money be made to go buy the thing, and then you can start using debt as a tool instead of a have yeah. to have type of thing. Yeah, definitely. Well, Let's do this. That's not the thing I wanted to share. That was just the title that I typed up and I had to have it typed up so I could copy and paste it. All right. Yeah. So here's our Lean and Mean. Shout out Lean and Mean Academy, Aaron Parker, who built awesome. this with me. Um, so the first thing we got to do now, let me, um, Adam, I'm going to take a little uh, side route here and just explain to the folks what this budget sheet is trying to do and how we have this organized and then we're going to start filling it out. So um, for those of you that haven't seen this, again, the the website to go download this thing is yourblueskies.com. If you want the lean and mean, this is for like the one, one person operation, maybe one person and a helper. If you want this specific version, you have to go to yourblueskies.com slash lean and mean. It's, I posted it in the comments already. I don't share this on our website with just anybody, specifically when we're talking about this thing. It's our super secret special weapon for lean and mean folks. Not for everybody, just for the lean and mean folks. So um, when we're filling this out, there's a couple different types of, uh, let's say, well, I won't get that far yet. When, when we're talking about sales, we're talking about cash sales, like deposited revenue coming in. Um, and we're going to break it down by month. And I, it's, it's important to note how many business days are in each month. And I put that at the top. And I, I list payrolls there. A lot of us, uh, if we have employees, we pay weekly. And so it's just a good thing to recognize that not all months are created equal. You're going to have lumps. And in, in this case, March had 23 business days to go generate revenue. February only had 20. So you, mm -hmm. you already have a 15% increase in revenue one month over the other for no reason other than there's just more Mondays through Fridays in that month. Um, Again, on payrolls, depending on how you pay, there's going to be months where you have more payrolls and less payrolls. So March only had four, but April's got five for all my businesses we pay weekly. So I just put that at the top because that influences some of the mathematical calculations. And there's going to be some months that just mathematically are going to be way better and some months that mathematically are going to be way worse, not because of how you operate, just because of days and payrolls and stuff like that. So that's like a side note, but that does play into the calculations below, especially when it comes to payroll and revenue. Um, so when you build a budget, everything kind of starts with revenue and our expenses are always a percentage of that. If you really want to nerd out and Adam, we can decide if we want to do this or not. I think it'd be something we'd circle back to. The best way to really build out your budget is to start with marketing. If you know, if you know how much money you're going to spend on marketing and then you add in referrals, client repeats, your acquisition cost, how much you need, how much you spend in marketing to get the next customer, and then what the average job size is, you you really like build your revenue up that way. Revenue revenue doesn't just happen because you say I'm going to do this much in a month. It happens because either people repeat, or they refer you, or you spend money on marketing and it starts driving jobs. Gotcha. Um, so we're going to start with just some like uh, revenue numbers that we want to shoot for. And if we want to hone that in more and actually like build out the marketing plan, there's actually a tab in here for sales and marketing specifically. And the, all the inputs are here, we fill it out. And if we want to use it, we just select use and it then pulls this into the other budget. Oh, wow. Um, okay. So there's, there's a ton of functionality like to, to nerd out on a whole bunch of different stuff in here, including sales and marketing, including payroll if you have a helper including balance sheet stuff for, for assets and loans that you might have. We're going to, uh, we're going to ignore all that stuff from now and just do like the base simple model of this. And then we can decide if we want to escalate and nerd out even more later. Sounds um, good. So we're going to start with sales and then, uh, just from a, like how this thing works, there's an industry target. This is pressure washing we're talking about. So all these percentage targets are based on not the industry best, but like, industry close to best averages not there's somewhere between the average and the best i didn't quite take the average because we want to budget for a little bit better than the average we want to, it's kind of a target budget it's not like exactly what we expect it's kind of what we want to shoot for but you know 
Uh, I grew up golfing a little bit and you don't always shoot for the pin because you're going to miss here or there. So you got to play a little bit conservative. So you don't plan on like knocking it out of the park every month. Over time, you want to be somewhere between average and the best. And that's a good like trajectory to shoot for. And hopefully you beat it more often than not. And then you can get more aggressive. Um, so we've got these industry targets in here. And then we can override those with any certain percentage we want. So okay. let's say um, uniforms and apparel you are going to, you know, say you're going to spend 1% on that instead of a half a percent. If we put a one in there, it automatically changes all the oh, wow. dollars, you know, accordingly. Um, so it just overrides it. Likewise, if we said, I want to spend $150 a month, that would override, you know, what we could put 5% in there, but the dollars are going to override that percentage. So there's a couple different ways we can override this target and say, gotcha. you know, I, and, and in general, the idea is the target is what we should be shooting for. But if we know that we're going to blow something out of the water or we're going to be way behind something, we shouldn't plan on a number that's never going to happen. It's just going to mislead us and give us false hope or false worry. So it is a good idea where we know that our percentages are going to differ wildly from that target. Let's plan on what we're going to shoot for, but know that this is what we want to shoot for. This is what the best businesses are achieving on a regular basis. So we allocate half a percent. Oh, let me I'm going to back up before I get into specifics. There's five categories of expenses that we're going to capture. There's cost of goods sold, which is at the top here. That's stuff that happens out in the field. That's your, the, the uniforms you're wearing, damages and repairs at a property, fuel to get there, supplies and chemicals that you're using while you're there. Um, we don't have wages in here because we're going to assume that right now you're the only one that's going out in the field and you're paying right. your sample distributions, which don't hit the P&L. So Normally, cost of goods sold would be heavy towards wages as your business scales. In the lean and mean model, if you're the one doing all the work, you're not necessarily taking a wage unless you're set up as an S corp, which would probably be a year two thing for you. Um, yeah. Now that's at a zero percent. So cost of goods sold happening in the field. We scroll down. Marketing. That's anything we're using to drive leads, make it look pretty, help them convert. Um, it's not the act of converting them that would fall in the admin bucket. This is going to be like this, the spend we have on ads, on marketing infrastructure, like our website, on labor and expertise that we pay to run our ads or do our website. Um, so it's all things meant to drive lead flow in and make it easy for them to buy from you. The admin side, you're not going to have a lot of this in a lean and mean business. You're going to, the admin would normally be a lot of overhead labor, people in the office and salespeople. Again, that's mostly going to be you. Um, you might have some accounting fees if you got a bookkeeper. Um, you. you might have some office supplies and expenses uh, or some bank charges, but this category in general is gonna be pretty minimal. It's the, it's the overhead that happens in an office, which when you're running lean and mean, there's not a whole lot of it. So a uh, question on that. Yeah. If, so I'm looking at using Jill's office to answer the phone for me and book appointments and do stuff like that. Would that go in this area? Yep, there's a line in here for a virtual assistant. Perfect. Okay, so that's cool. where Jill's office will go. Right now we have it as zero. So that'll be something we'll put an override in for you. Okay, perfect. Um, now we got two more overhead buckets. And this is act, the, these two buckets are is where I see most business owners totally fail because it's like out of sight, out of mind. We don't pay attention to it. And it's where money just like falls out of our bank account. And we never notice it. Fixed costs are stuff that's like infrastructure locked in for the business our insurance, maybe some rent, phone bills, utility bills, software stuff where you're like paying monthly and it's hard to get out of. If your business goes up or goes down, these bills stay the same. Correct. So these are like sticky costs that you decide and you live with for, for until your contract is up. The next one is variable costs. Variable costs are like all over the damn map. They're reactive. Things happen. You decide to spend money on them or not. So random auto expenses for like tags, licenses, whatever. Uh, leadership development events that you might go to, meals and entertainment. Uh, you won't have any employee engagement in this model. We're assuming we don't have any employees. Um, maybe some for recruiting if you are trying to get some help. Um, repairs and maintenance stuff. Repairs and maintenance is like almost cost of goods sold because it is so close to supporting the truck and whatever that's going out into the field. But it's not, you can't point to Mrs. Jones's job and say, yep, use this out there. Right. It's like, no, I just need an oil change because I'm, you know, at 5,000 miles or whatever. So, yeah. so it's kind of a reactive thing. In a lot of cases, it's variable because you could do it yourself if you really felt like it. Okay. Um, 
maybe not all the time with repairs and maintenance, but you know, a lot of times we're, we're not total gearheads, but a lot of us can fix some simple stuff. And we just got to decide if we want to spend our time changing our own oil or taking it in. Right. Gotcha. Um, so some shop supplies may be in there for tools to wrench on stuff travel, travel meals, depending on what you got going. But these are generally reactive things that are more of a frugality thing. It's, you know, it's a once a year or once a random time type of expense. It's not a premeditated, predetermined expense. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> so whereas fixed costs are more of like negotiating, contracting, these are more like frugality based. Um, and that leaves us with our profit margin. Now, the the crazy thing is, and when Aaron and I built this together, I was like, I don't doubt these numbers. These all make sense to me mathematically, but it's amazing how much money a lean and mean business can make without all the infrastructure. And we'll for sure add some costs in here uh, that are like the virtual assistant and stuff like that. But the, the profit margin that I usually see for a scaled pressure washing business, that is, you know, 250,000 or more where they're hiring employees and the owner's not always out doing the work and so forth. That percentage is like 20% if they're doing really well. Um, okay. we're looking at 63% here. So now part of that is because that's your wage and your owner, you know, when, when you're a business operator, you get paid two different ways. And most people don't realize that, but you get paid for the work that you do. And then the business generates a profit. And as the owner of the business, you get to distribute that profit to yourself. Um, you can also reinvest in the business. You don't have to distribute it, but it pays to, know and be aware of the fact that you're wearing two different hats and when you're out doing the work you get paid for doing the work and when you're the business owner at the end of the year you get a distribution for your capital investment in the company but those are two different ways of paying yourself um and you and you always you always should get paid for doing the work but if the business isn't making a profit um you know then you wouldn't get a distribution in this case they're all kind of rolling in together because you're lean and mean, you're doing both at the same time. Awesome. Does that all make sense? Yeah. Should we put some real numbers in here for you? Let's do it. <laughs> so um, have you had a chance now, like January, February, March, we could probably just like guess or, or estimate what you've already done for the year. Do you know those numbers off the top of your head? Or at so least close to? March, I only did. So <laughs> this is going to sound bad, but I only did about 2,500 um february i don't even know that i did any jobs at all to be honest um actually i i probably did about 1500 dollars that month nope and in january i know i didn't do anything because i wasn't really focusing on anything that month so oh cool i mean i know you did something in march because when i was talking to you you're out uh spraying water on a person's house so you're that's you're out. true that that was that was in march yeah so i actually i did about four that week so yeah okay there it is. There it is. Now, what are you shooting for in April? So, man, right now I'm already at about 1800 and I just lined up four more jobs today. So I've got a job Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday next week. Um, and I've got three others that are going to be towards the end of the month. So I would like to aim for about four, th about $5,000 this month, I'd say. Cool. And then uh, have you booked anything into May yet? Um, I'm trying to think, um, I don't think I have, but I do have, um, an email blast going out to my former clients from last year. And most of the jobs I did last year were like May, June, July. So I'm going to see if I can get them on the books for those times as well. Nice. Nice. Do you, do you have a, uh, like a rough estimate of what you want that trajectory to be going through the summer? Would like to make at least a minimum of ten thousand dollars a month okay starting in may bump that to 10 yeah let's do that and then do you want me to like carry that through the summer or do you think it'll keep going nice up or to, and i mean i would like to set a target to increase you know maybe like june be i mean 12 50 and then july be 15 like a gradual increase there and then maybe august be 20 yeah yeah. Um, and then for me, I mean, out here in South Carolina, it slows down about October. And that's because that's when we have the big pollen season and nobody wants to wash. Um, and, and that's kind of why we had a slow go this year is our pollen season was extended. So I didn't get any calls until the end of February and slash second week in March because pollen was so bad for about five weeks out here. 
Gotcha. So, so like November, December kind of slows down to very slow. Time. Yeah. Yeah. I think in November though, I was still doing at least about 2,500 bucks a month in jobs. Okay. So, so but that was also with no, no advertising, no website, no Google page. That was just next door, you know, yep. Hey, I'll come wash your house, you know? So, yep. Should we leave? How do you feel about leaving October at 20 and then kind of slowing it down into November, that December? Works. That works. Yeah. Okay. Maybe do like 15 and then 10 or what are you thinking? Oh, yeah, that works. Okay. So now, um, I love having goals. And yeah. I think uh, setting something gives us like the, gets us over the mental hurdle of why we're trying to accomplish something. So it kind of sets that thing out there that we're chasing. And then, then we build the business model to go hit the thing that we put out in front of us. Correct. We're like, we're like kind of addicted as entrepreneurs to doing that. Um, which, like I said earlier, like we just love the challenge and we love, we love the opportunity to gain the pride of doing something hard. Yeah. So we got 130,000, 131,000 uh, budgeted for the year. See, my, now, my goal this year was 100. So um, I don't know if we want, we want to keep it there or, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? You know, my only, so, so I want to try not to influence too much with my biases. Okay. In, in Minneapolis, one thing that's, that happens to us big time and, and we're, it may be different because we're scaled up. So this has happened consistently since we've been like in the 400,000 range and up to a million here is our July and August, like May and June is as fast as we can go. And then July 4th hits and everybody freaking disappears. And it could be, so like last year in June, we did 123,000 or something. July, we did 80, August, we did 60. Um, wow. and now August was super low because nobody called in July. So part of the work we had in July was booked during May and June, but we have, a, I think Minnesota is probably more susceptible to it than South Carolina would be, but it's like July 4th hits and everybody's up North. Nobody is in the, nobody's working. Nobody's thinking about how stuff they basically gotcha. like July 4th hits and they're on vacation for the rest of the summer until school starts is, okay. is what it kind of feels like. Gotcha. Um, I don't know. I don't have you. Do you notice that in South Carolina at all? Do you see any seasonality like that happening? I know like summer can obviously get pretty hot for you guys. Um, do you see a slowdown happen in the summer for that reason at all? No, I, th I feel like we get busier um, during. In fact, the week before the Fourth of July last year, I think is when I had the most jobs. I did. I want to say thirty six hundred dollars in two days, three days, because. They were like, oh my God, my mom's coming to town. My house has to get cleaned or she's going to yell at me because it's dirty, you know? And, yep. and I, I do remember that I took a Monday off of work. I actually called out sick from work and I actually had a buddy come help me. I told him I'd pay him 200 bucks to help me. I rented a pressure washer because I still had that little Ryobi. And we went and we knocked out eight jobs in one day. And we started at about 8 a.m. We ended at about 9 p.m. But I ended up walking away with about $2,300 that day. So <laughs> it was exhausting. But, you know, it was totally worth it because I realized, like, man, there's something to this. And I only paid him 150 bucks for 12 hours worth of work. But I walked away with a good chunk of cash to, you know, reinvest into myself into the business. So Well, that's why he's a buddy. You know, that's how you know he's a good friend. Comes exactly. and helps you make a whole bunch of money. Exactly. So let's, uh, I, when I do budgets and I do this with all of our companies, I actually just did it in the last couple of weeks here. I revise them quarterly. You're always getting new and better information and you don't want to change your budget every month. Like that's too yeah. often that you feel like you're chasing your tail, but once three months go, goes by, take a look at this thing and, and like, you can punch the actuals into here. There's, there's, there, I didn't, I see that talk yeah. about it before, but like, there's the budget rows and then the actual rows right below it. So you can kind of see where you're actually heading and then use that to tweak your budget for the next three months. Okay. Um, so we do that with all of our businesses. We want to, we set a goal for the year. That goal doesn't change, but throughout the year, we want to adjust and talk to our team members about like what we're actually on track for and what we need to hit that month based on the current reality. Sometimes, okay. 
if if we if we kicked ass in Q1, we should up our budget for Q2 because why would we expect to like go back to what we had said at the end of the year? Like the trajectory true. has changed. Our expectations are much higher because we've proven something. Um, that makes sense. Likewise, yeah. if COVID happens, like we have to rebudget because the world just changed and we need to like respond accordingly to what the world's telling us is going on. So okay. I, I think budgeting and, and like rebudgeting quarterly is good, but it's still always useful to have that kind of long-term term target uh, that you originally set your sights on. So it's like a little bit of both. Okay. Um, yeah, let's just start there then. Oh, cool, cool. So um, let's set these targets here so the industry target again we're like ignoring labor because you're going to be the one doing the work do you do you imagine ever using subcontractors to just knock out bigger jobs whether it's your buddy or drag your wife out there and have her spray some water around and pay so, her a few bucks what do you think i do i do have a buddy here in town that has a big huge rig set up and whenever i do have a bigger job i have him come help me and we either split the job or you know, he takes enough to cover his fuel and his labor costs for the day. Um, but I mean, typically we kind of end up helping each other out. Um, but that could be something that I guess I could budget for. Um, he helps me probably three or four times a month, but I also help him about three or four times a month. So. Gotcha. I, Is it, I was going to say, do you guys just do it like I'll help you. You help me. We won't exchange dollars. Or do you do it like when I help I, you? So you like if, if it's like a $200 job, I'll pay him like 50 bucks to come out and just let, basically let me use his rig, um, you know, um, or I'll say, hey, man, how much do you need to cover your fuel and, you know, cost of being here for two hours? And he'll say like, yeah, just like a hundred bucks. And then I'll pay him a hundred bucks for like a $300 job or something. Okay. So, yeah. so I'd say if you're, if you're, if you're exchanging money, then let's put it down as a subcontractor because that's where okay. it's going to, you know, that's where it's going to fall for that expense goes through your bank account. So then I think the question would be like, should we try to shoot for a percentage that says, you know, two or 3% every month goes to a subcontractor that or do we just say like a couple hundred bucks a month? Um, let's do a percentage. Okay. Yeah. Like 2% that kind of ends up being 50 to a hundred here in the short term. And then over the summer, as you get going, it's three, 400 bucks. Okay. Seems pretty, it seems reasonable. Yeah. That's, that's not bad. Okay. Um, I got money in here for uniforms and apparel, half a percent. That's just so you can look pretty while you're out there and, you know, have some good gear that you feel good about. To be honest, I don't have any, so it's good to have that in there. Yeah. I mean, it's not like game changing money, but 50 bucks here, 75 bucks yeah. there. Like you're going to want polo shirts and jackets and pants and, uh, hats and whatever that is branded that, um, yeah. looks good. You feel good about wearing. So I love budgeting that. I, and like, and, and kind of the same with this customer damages and repairs. It's the same dollar amount. Like you're going to burn stuff. You're going to run over a lady's plant. You're going to knock over a mailbox. It doesn't yeah. matter how careful you are. Shit's going to happen. Just yeah. plan on a half a percent. Like I, so if you might get under it, you're going to be under it. You're going to have zero damages and repairs expenses for three months in a row. And then you're going to have to pay 500 bucks to somebody for something stupid. Um, exactly. No, I agree. It's just the thing that happens. So we've got at that half a percent, it's, you know, 650 bucks for the year. Um, and that's a good, that's a good target to shoot for is to be around that half percent or under. 4% um, for fuel, which is that's your vehicle. You're, you're, because you're driving the car, you're, you might be even like 3%. Um, yeah, I mean, I probably, so I fill my car up about twice a month and it, it did get up a little bit with the new price changes and, and fuel. I used to be able to fill my car up for about 28 bucks, but it's costing me about 37 now. So um, I spend probably about 60 bucks a month in total on fuel for my car. And then um, the last like five jobs I did, I think I ran off of 10 gallons of fuel. So um, my machine actually does very, it's very fuel efficient. So nice, nice. I, uh, the only reason I'd leave this at four, it's, it's four is more like if you're driving a bigger truck around, gotcha. um, but if gas prices go up, obviously the budget needs to go up too. Um, the only reason I'd leave it at four is usually when you're solo, you're driving farther to jobs. You, you won't always get a whole bunch of jobs right next to each other. You might have two jobs on the opposite side of town on the same day 
And if you have a couple crews, that works fine. You just split everybody up. But if it's just you, you have to like maybe move one the next day and just be in this part of town this day. Yeah. But four percent gives you a little more wiggle room to to operate within. Okay. So I don't know that we need to adjust it and try to again like in golfing reference, you don't need to shoot for the pin. You just gotcha. need to give yourself enough wiggle room to be able to run the stuff and not have to obsess about it. Okay. Um, if we see that after a few months, you're consistently two eight, two nine, three percent, then we adjust it down. Cool. Um, merchant processing fees. This is a goofy one because uh, getting paid is part of doing a job. Like you don't you don't go spray water on Mrs. Jones's house and be like, this one's on me today, Mrs. Jones. Um, <laughs> Unless, unless you're a bartender too, that every once in a while, maybe you do that. Uh, but merchant fees, I throw into cost of goods sold because I, you know, you can point to that job and be like, that was part of the cost of doing that job. I had to pay a, the credit card processing company to run a card. Do you, do you run credit cards? You just take check and cash or how, how are you operating today? Um, well, I, I mostly ask for check and cash, but I do. Um, I use invoices by, um, I want to say it's by, um, trying to think of the name of it, not swipe, but, um, the one, the square, square, square invoices. So I do use that. And I I don't remember what the percent is on that though. You know, I I think it's not cheap. It's probably a little over 3%, but it's also like, you're probably not going to run that on every single job you do. So this is like, I'm probably going to average for a month. Yeah. If that most people want to pay with cash or check. Okay. Let's let's call it one one point five percent, which would be like a little less than half your jobs run a credit okay. card. And again, we can keep an eye on it and adjust it as you go forward. Perfect. Um, supplies and chemicals. So there's there's two lines here that kind of uh, intercept between uh, the stuff that you're using out in the field and the stuff that like uses the stuff up. Um, let me explain that a little more clearly. Supplies and chemicals would be for stuff that get used up that would be your surfactant and your chlorine um maybe if you got rags or booties if you're going in somebody's house just like disposable shit it's yeah. mostly going to be chemical for you like 90 percent of it's going to be chemical but there might be other like little small disposable parts or this or that thing that don't aren't like tools and equipment the tools and equipment would be the stuff that you use in every house and again it's like this is one of those where it's like, yeah, you can't necessarily point to Mrs. Jones's job and say, this cost you this for this piece of equipment. But this is the stuff that's at every job. And I differentiate, you know, the hose reel that goes to every job and the hose that goes to every job. And that's like tools and equipment. You're literally using it damn near every job you go to versus the wrenches and the sockets and stuff that are back at the shop for tooling on stuff. Okay. That's a variable expense. It's a shop supply. It's not out doing the work the pressure washer and the hoses and all that stuff like that's out doing the work every day. So, well, you know, you're not going to buy a new pressure washer every time you go to wash a house because it's that instrumental tool doing the thing that's out there. We put that into tools and equipment. Okay. That makes sense. In, in general now, like we may bump this up because you're, we know you're investing in more stuff. Yeah. This is, this is one of those where it's like 3% is a good over time, but when you're first investing in the setup, you're you're gonna have to spend more on the damn setup. Like there's just no way around that. Um, like I said, the the best part for you is that you're doing the work before you build the setup. So the work you're doing now pays for the setup. So it's not like Correct. you have to borrow a bunch of money to build this thing out. The work you're doing is already paying for it. Gotcha. Um, so if we look at just like the first few months of the year here, that's 270 bucks set aside, you know, through the end of April here, which what that gets you like a hose reel. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so then it's like 300 to 400 bucks a month. And as you go, it's going to keep going up. Now yeah. you're going to have months where you spend like a hundred bucks on tools and equipment. Cause you just needed to replace a hose. And then yeah. you're going to have months where you spend 2000. Um, gotcha. I, I'm more about for, for a lumpy category like this, don't beat yourself up over missing a month and don't celebrate when you win a month because, uh, you're going to have those lumpy months where you have to buy a whole bunch of shit. And then the next month, you're not going to buy anything. And so you're more managing for the year end number. So we got four grand in there for tools and equipment. 
again, I'm not going to look at any month too specifically. The question is, is four grand going to be enough for you to set up that trailer with everything that you need? Now, the trailer itself is probably going to be over 2,500 bucks. Do you have an idea? No. So the one that I'm actually buying is about $700. It's a, it's okay. a little four by six. Gotcha. Gotcha. So if it's under $2,500, it falls into this bucket. Uh, if it's over 2,500 per IRS rules that it's a capital asset, it goes on the balance sheet. It gets gotcha. depreciated over time. You guys might've had that in the gym with different pieces of equipment. Maybe. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah we did. Had to capitalize versus maybe dumbbells could be expensed. Um, so in this case, that trailer would go on here. So that's 700 bucks. Uh, you're going to have a couple hose reels, hoses. I'm looking, at, I'm looking at at least three hose reels at about 250 a piece. So, you know, that's about um, 750. Um, I do have, currently I have 200 foot of pressure hose, but one of them looks like it's about to bust. So I know I'm going to have about $120 there. Yep. Um, I know I need to buy some soft wash hose because I did, um, I'm in the process of getting a soft wash pump as well. Um, I know, um, I just got Flexilla hose in the mail the other day. I spent about 75 bucks for hundred feet on that. So that's awesome. What, and how much, how much do you expect to spend on that uh, pump setup? So the pump itself is 200. The hose for it was like 120 for the soft wash hose that I'm looking at getting. And okay. then the hose reel uh, is already in, in, in there. So two hundred dollars for that soft wash pump okay i put 350 for the pump in that hose perfect um what else you need on there trying to yeah um i do have a surface cleaner that i just bought that i bought that for 350 from my buddy okay. um and then i would like to get some holding tanks for surfactant and for um um the chemical because i don't have any of those yet so i'd like to get two of those and my buddy was saying they're about 180 bucks a piece for yeah. like a seven gallon one yep i don't know if that's right but um that sounds about can. right the now i'm gonna say like i'm gonna put 200 extra dollars in here just for like straps bolts uh okay. tie downs like just shit to secure brackets whatever you need to like secure the stuff on Okay, and then the hitch that I bought was 175. Um, and then I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I think that's about it for the actual equipment. Yeah. So we're around 3,000 bucks. But yeah. I also just know from experience that those are just the things that we thought of now. Um, well, I'm and then definitely going to have to get a new, I'm probably going to have to get a new pressure washer midsummer. Um, this one's about three years old. My buddy used it solid for two years. And um, like I said, he sold it to me for about 900 bucks. Um, it does work well right now. It, you know, it, it, it putters every now and then, but um, I have been getting my eyes on some new pressure washers. So that is going to be an expense that's going to come here soon. How much, what, what ballpark are you in? Are you thinking like a couple thousand bucks or are you thinking of getting like a $5,000, you know, balls to the walls type of it's setup? It's probably going to be like a two or $3,000 one. I don't think I'm going to go balls to the wall yet. Okay. Yet. Let's say it's, I'm going to say just for sake of this exercise so that we put it in here yeah. to, to like capture it, we'll, we'll say it's 2,500 bucks. Perfect. So that would like just, doing the math and adding all that stuff up that's like 56 uh 50 there so i'm gonna say if we said tools and equipment at five percent that gives you a little bit of wiggle room no, um, that's awesome yeah basically a thousand bucks for other shit that comes up because you know there's going to be other stuff um, <laughs> always and, yeah so um hope for the best plan for the worst type of thing um and i do six percent for chemical the, now i find the bigger your company is the more your chemical tends to be because guys just freaking waste it when it's you you're a little more like not just throwing this stuff around like this is my chemical yeah. like i know what this costs um yep. so you might be able to beat that six percent with the chemicals and supplies and the surfactant and stuff the downside is you also don't don't have the luxury of buying in as much bulk as a bigger company does so you yeah. might have the same price so 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've been looking at buying it in bulk because down here it's about 140, 140 bucks for 55 gallons. Um, whereas I've been buying the little five gallon jugs and the five gallon jugs are 80 bucks. So it's like, yep, yep. I don't have enough jobs to do the 55 gallon drum, but I, you know, um, so it, it's either like $6 a gallon when you go with the, the full 12% for the five gallon jug, or it's, mm -hmm. you know, it goes down to like $2 and you know, 10 cents or something when you buy the 55 gallon drum. So, so. true story, I can uh, confidently say that you can fit 22 empty five gallon jugs in a 2009 Toyota Corolla. Nice. Um, <laughs> that's the, uh, I, I never pressure washed out of it, but I would run the empty jugs back to our supplier, which was like 35 minutes across the other side of town because we, we didn't have a shop where we could have a bulk supply at all. Now we got 55 gallon drums, but at the time we didn't have a shop. We had to like literally carry these five gallon, you know, carboys into the office and we'd go buy them 20 or 30 at a pop, like a couple times a week. And then I'd throw them in the Corolla to take them back. Cause I, I didn't want to drive the F-150 all the way across town. It's like a 40 minute drive. I didn't yeah. get 22 empties in a Corolla. What do I need the F-150 for? <laughs> Unless I'm picking up full ones. Um, That's awesome. But, I've dealt with a five gallon carboy a time or two and I got, awesome. I Tetris the shit out of them. I could. That's Tetris awesome, them. man. That's yeah. awesome. Um, all right. So gross profit. Now this is, uh, you know, we, we get our revenue and then we got to spend money on our cost of goods sold. The stuff that's going out the doors, the money's coming in. So gross profit is what we have left as business owners to reinvest in the business, whether it's investing in the infrastructure, more marketing or, in our spouse so they don't kill us for being entrepreneurs yeah um, so so we're doing 130,000 of uh revenue we're keeping 105 of that about 80 okay. percent now we got to spend money on marketing you yep. in general i've got nine percent in here this is just like a rough um you could do five percent you could do three percent you could do twenty percent marketing is one of those goofy things where even like recruiting is the same way for a scaling company to me. There's no real budget. It's, are you getting a return on your investment? And if you are, you keep spending more money until you run out of capacity to go clean the stuff. Like yeah. if you're spending 20% on marketing, but everything you're spending money on converts at a really good acquisition cost. And you know, every time you go clean it, you make money on it. Like keep freaking spending the money on marketing and go find more people to go clean the shit for you. Yeah. Uh, so, so I, I put marketing at around 9%, but it's just a total ballpark of you need some infrastructure. You might give some money to charity. You're sure as hell spending some money on ads, whether that's flyers, Google ads, Facebook ads, whatever you got. Um, and then you got marketing labor. If you're paying somebody to do the Google ads or to do the SEO. That's so, so can we pop some numbers in there for what I've already looked into? Yeah, let's do it. So the, the website and marketing software, um, the company that I want to use is called Madwire Media out of Colorado, and they're, it's $3.95 a month, and it's a fixed cost um, at $3.95 a month, and that includes website, CRM, local listings on 25 local websites. They manage everything. They do all the SEO. They do all the Google. They manage the Google page. They do everything, and then anything over that 395 that I invest is basically ad spend. So they'll either do ads on Google, they'll do ads on Facebook, they'll do ads on um, Instagram, whatever I want to do. Um, mm -hmm. They did tell me that um, if I were to just to do $500 a month on Google ads, that it would roughly like the cost per lead, like an actual converting lead name, phone number, email would be roughly around $18 for my area. That's not bad. You can make that work all day. Yeah. So they, they, they said 500 would be a good place to start because that would land me at least 10 to 15 jobs a month. Um, okay. I'm going to put that know. 395 under the labor contractor since it's kind of their expertise. We could, we could split it, but it's not going to, it doesn't change the way the math rolls up really. Okay. Um, I and will, then um, I did just start Facebook with um, John, John Vitt who does marketing and yep. Um, it was 250 to get started. And then the ad spend on that's about 500 a month. But um, 
with that, I mean, I, there's people on there that I'm seeing who are making an extra 1500 to 2k a week just off of those ads. So now you said it was 200 to get started. Is it, or was it 250? I don't remember if you said it was 250 to get started. Okay. That was just and a one time fee. Does he have a monthly fee or is that 500 kind of include his fee too? No. So the, the 500 a month is just your ad spend. He sets up the ads. That, well, I guess he does kind of manage them, but you're just paying for ad spend after the initial setup. Oh, really? So he doesn't have to do like labor on an ongoing basis. Correct. Yeah. Gotcha. 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 Okay. Um, so it was just a one-time um, fee to get that set up. Gotcha. Okay. I don't know um, how to fill it on there, but. Yeah. Do you, that was basically in April here? Correct. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to do, uh, I'm going to highlight it so we know oh, what perfect. it is. Facebook. Oh, man. Johnny V. Yeah. I'll just call, I'll just call him that since he's not here to defend himself. Perfect. Um, <laughs> and then, I don't know, should we put anything in for charitable donation? I just kind of put it as a placeholder, but it doesn't need to be there. Uh, it doesn't matter. I'm, I would love to donate, you know, my last business, I gave 30% to nonprofit. Um, but that was a long time ago. So I'll say, well, let's, uh, I like, I'm going to put it to zero. And then okay. once you have the profit, you can do whatever the hell you want with it. Let's do it. Um, I, I put that in there as a, like, we do cleaning for a reason with our home cleaning businesses and it's 20 bucks a month. And it's real like, it's to do the right thing. Our employees really love it. So it has an employee engagement perspective. Like we're going and cleaning homes for cancer patients. Oh, wow. But That's it also, awesome. it's also a thing we can market with and say, we do this. Right. So at the awesome. end of the day, any charity that your business does is really marketing. And there's okay. no other place that makes sense to put it. So if you are like, yeah, you know, it makes sense for my business to support Habitat for Humanity and I give them 50 bucks a month on an ongoing basis, we would drop it in here. Okay, um, cool. So I put the 395 for the marketing firm here instead of under software and web website. I think the like the software and website, it sounds like they're paying like the GoDaddy website hosting type of fee thing. That's yeah, so they actually do the hosting. Um, they do all the management on that. And then the software side of it, like like a CRM or something like that, it, that's all included in that as well. So any leads that come in through any of their marketing they actually can do, um, they can do texting, emailing, phone calls, um, call, they do all the call tracking numbers on, on everything that they do. Um, they even do, um, oh man, they do um, bring list voicemails as well. So if you've got a list of yeah. like three to 500 people, they'll even send out a ring list voicemail to your previous list, which I was not very smart at tracking all of the 200 plus houses I did last year. But yeah. they go knock on their doors, get their name and phone number, and we'll go ahead and send them a text message. <laughs> I was like, all right, let's do it. So I like it. I like it. So the only other thing that I could think that would maybe go here would be something like responsive. I don't know if you're going to ask you, I do want to use responsive. Is that where that would go? Yeah, I put it here. I kind of view that as like a, it's a software that's purely meant to help convert, you know, leads and get them closer to being clients. So okay. I wouldn't, there's a, there's a software item down in um, fixed expenses for more of like your CRM thing where it's more of an operating expense. It's not all marketing related. Um, okay. uh, maybe if you had like a recruiting software or an HR software, if you had more employees, that would go into like fixed cost software. Okay. Software that would go in here would be very much geared towards getting people to find you and buy easier. Okay. So responsible would be something I'd put in here. Can we go ahead and add that? Because I, I do want to budget for that because I, I really would like to use responsive ed. Yeah, it's like 200 a month. Uh, 250 is the responsive ed that includes the direct mail, ringless voicemails with um, um, the send gem. Gotcha. So. Well, if you already got ringless voicemails through these guys, I don't know if you need. Oh, yeah, then I guess 199 is their base package then. Okay. Let's start with that. We can always adjust it. Perfect. That works. Freaking love response, Ben and Kurt. Yeah. Have you ever have you ever heard of um, Deal Machine? No. That's another software I'm looking at using. Um, 
it's about 50 bucks a month. Um, the way that it works is you drive around and if you see a dirty house, you click on it on their, on their app and it sends them direct mail. And um, the way that it works is you can set up campaigns. So if it's a dirty roof, you can select to send them a dirty roof um, campaign. If it's a, you know, like moldy siding, you can send a moldy siding and you can set it to where it sends one every two weeks, one every three weeks, one every week. Um, the only what's thing the, what's it, the, what is it called? It's called Deal Machine. It's actually made for real estate investors. Um, but I contacted them and found out that I could use it for pressure washing as well. The only thing is, is they do have a higher cost per um, mailer just because they're custom made. Each mailer has that homeowner's um, a picture of their house on it and says, is this your house? And then it says something clever like, your house is nasty. Let me come clean it, you know, and then you put like whatever you want on there. But you can set it up to where it sends out once a week or every two weeks or every four weeks. Or you can even do like today in seven days and then 14 and then 21 until you actually hear back from them interesting i'm writing that down i think that'd be awesome for our salesperson out there to go like yeah like on houses when he's out cruising the neighborhood and get him into a campaign it's awesome um we actually used it to do wholesale deals for real estate and um my buddy he spends a good chunk of money on that and he has like five different guys that drive around and click on houses and he just sends them mailers and that's how he gets all of his deals. So I like it. I like it. Cool. Into that one. But yeah, that's like uh, 50 bucks a month. Um, and then whatever the cost of mailers are, but that's their base, like software cost is the 50 bucks a month. Okay. For, for your marketing budget, did you have any of these expenses through March or are these really starting up in April? <laughs> They're going to start up probably in April. Okay. I'm just going to yeah. zero out the first few months of the year. Perfect. I'll highlight them just so we don't, uh, since, since I'm overriding them with dollars, I don't want to show the dollars here when they didn't actually get spent here. I still want to zero those out. Um, gotcha. So I'll knock that out. Um, cool. Now, just so we see it, the percentage of revenue, you know, it starts at a, at a really high percentage of 37% because you're spending a lot on marketing before the revenue really starts going. Then as the revenue starts going, that percentage dwindles back down, comes back up November, December, but that'd be 11% on marketing, which I think is a totally reasonable marketing spend. Okay, cool. Good to know. Um, admin, there's not a whole lot going on here. Accounting services, I know what that is. Yep. <laughs> Um, the, there's a little bit of bank charges. I, for accounting services, maybe we should put something in for CPA fees. Did you pay a CPA for 2020? I did not. Um, I did not. Well, we have a guy that does our taxes. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's about 1200 a year and that was personal and business. Okay. So I think my my viewpoint would be like that's all a business expense because the business generates the income that they're reporting. Okay. Um, he did he already do twenty twenty? Uh, he's working on it right now. Okay. Did he bill you for it yet? Not yet. So okay. it'll probably be like May ish. I'm guessing he already filed an extension for us. I'm just gonna drop it in there Perfect. and then color code that one so we see it. And then in this section is where we would add um, Jill's office if I wanted to go with that service. Is that correct? Yep. Would that be like a percentage or a monthly fee or how? how... It's it's ninety nine dollars a month is their base fee. That includes like thirty minutes or forty minutes, and then anything after that is I think forty cents a minute or thirty cents a minute. Okay. So it starts off at ninety nine dollars as a service fee. Okay. So there's like 99 built in here and then there'd be additional fees on top of it as you use more of it. Of course, yeah, because as you increase, you know, sales and stuff like that, because they do all your booking for you and everything. They're like your total, it's an office manager without hiring an office manager. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. So that seems like 
fairly reasonable to me. You're paying for basically like a week a month. You're paying for 25% of somebody's time okay. at 600 bucks. Um, does that seem ballpark to you? Does it pass a sniff test for that cost? Yeah. I mean, I've never used um, them before, but just looking into them, I mean, I mean, they're, they also use responsive bid to do all your bids for you. So from what I've heard from like Bobby Walker talking about them, they have been able to generate more income just because they're there to answer the phone 24 seven, you know? Yep. So definitely. Okay. We'll start there. If we need to adjust it from there, we can always tweak it going forward. But I think that covers the $99 fee and then it keeps adding to it as you get busier and busier. As you get busier. That works. Yeah. Um, bank charges. I just got some shit in there for that because it cool. happens uh, for assessment fees and this and that whatever bank you got they always seem to charge you a fee here or there um and then office supplies and expenses that's like paper computers printers like just things you would use at your home office for work um so half a percent throughout the year gives you a seven 650 700 bucks for the year again gotcha. it's not like game changing money but um door hangers would that go under here or would that be up in marketing that would go in marketing Okay. I would put I that. Done in your... I haven't done door hangers before. Um, what I do, uh, I, I did buy from UZ Marketing, I bought 100 yard signs for $99. And that was in December of last year. And so far, that's what's landed me the past 10 jobs is just my yard signs. So nice. Yeah. Any of that stuff I'd put under ad spend and awareness. It's okay. just another way to get people to see you, to call you to, to buy something. So yeah. I put that under ad spend awareness. We could, um, in your PL, we could break out digital ad and print ad. So like okay. flyers, and yard signs could go in one category and then Google ads, Facebook ads, that stuff could go in another category. Cool. Let's do that on that area. Yeah, that'd work. Okay. Um, so I don't, I don't think there's anything else we got to change with the admin stuff. Perfect. On the fixed overhead costs, the insurance is the biggest one there. Do you have a rough idea of what uh, liability and auto insurance is for you? Um, so like the business liability insurance that I got quoted was 158 a month. Okay. Um, and then as far as auto insurance for both of our cars, we pay 160. Okay. So I don't know if I should break that up just do my vehicle or... I was going to say, the, you won't be able to claim it for your wife's vehicle unless she's using okay. it more than 50% in the, in the business. The, there's, a, there's a cutoff point where if you use a, an asset like that more than 50% in the business, you can basically call it a business asset, and okay. then you can write it off for depreciation purposes. You could take the mileage deduction, too, uh, for business miles you know, that you record. Um, I think it's easier to just put it, if you use it more than 50% in the business, which is a business owner, you tend to, um, then you just put it, you just value it, put it on the business books at whatever the value of it is, and then pay that insurance out of a business account and pay your wife's insurance on that car out of a personal account and just split them up. Okay. Um, let's well, say in that case, my car is like 80 bucks a month. Hers is the hundred because mine is uh a lot older and also um i think mine's liability only whereas hers is like the full coverage and everything gotcha gotcha um hers is a new car too so will you have will you have to pay more in insurance once you get the trailer rigged up i think is the other question um, i honestly haven't looked into it so <laughs> have not looked uh, into that for now again this is one like it's I think this 2% is the right number to shoot for. And if we were just going to do that, it'd really be like 200 a month gets us really damn close to that. Okay. Um, and what did you okay, say thanks. the liability quote was that you got? It was 150 or 158 a month, I think. Um, okay. And it was through Joseph D. Walters insurance company. They're a big pressure washer company. Yep. And it was like 158 a month. Okay. I'm going to put it at 250. I guess you okay. question it's at 2.3% for insurance. Okay. Um, software expense here would be like the CRM fee, but it's kind of built into your marketing. So we'll just leave it there. Okay. Uh, the only, I, I don't know what other softwares you have, maybe like a, 
at some point you might have like a GPS tracking software. If an employee is driving a vehicle, you might have uh, like an HR software or something like that, which is just background stuff for the business. Do you have any other softwares or apps you can think of that you're paying for monthly? I really don't have any that I use. Um, I've heard about a lot of good ones that, you know, I've heard on these different podcasts and stuff like that, but as of right now, the ones we already listed up above are the ones that I'm really focused on using to j j just to get started. Gotcha. Okay. So um, let's leave a percent in there and okay. let's take it down to, uh, I'm going to take it down to like a half a percent just to give you, just to give you some wiggle room in case you find something that you want to use. You're not like, I don't have it in the budget. Can't use <laughs> it. Um, the other one would be utilities, phone, internet. Yours might be higher. I'm guessing you got a cell phone you're using for the business. Maybe your personal that you're using both places. Um, what do you have there? Uh, so my cell phone is about 130 a month and that's for two lines. So if we were just to take that in half, it'd be 60 bucks a month. Okay. But my, uh, my internet and all of that is out of my home office. Okay. So. What you'll probably actually end up doing then is claiming it as a, probably paying it as a personal expense and claiming it on your taxes as a business expense paid out of pocket besides your phone. I would yeah. say your phone would be the one thing in here where it's like, that's got to go in here. Okay. Uh, the, the bills that you pay for your home office, you're going to pay your utilities out of your personal account. And then when your tax person does the taxes, they'll make an estimate of like percent of business use of that thing. And you'll get the tax write off for it that way. But we Perfect. won't drop it on the business here. We'll just put the 80 bucks a month for the phone. Perfect. Last thing. These, these are like all the piddly things that just add up. So there's some other auto expenses, tags, licenses, penalties, that sort of thing. I don't, you're probably not going to have a ton of that. Maybe like a couple hundred bucks for the year. Whoops. That'd be like 20 bucks a month on average but you're gonna have to like title like license your vehicle for the year and then maybe like a little bit of wiggle room there for just other random stuff okay um education events leadership development i feel like that's a tricky one because you could spend a thousand bucks on it and go to a whole bunch of things and go like try to build your education for the industry or you yeah. could be like no i'll just watch youtube videos right um <laughs> you know uh and quick plug, huge convention coming up in August since we missed it last year. I want to go to it. Okay. I'd say let's leave this at a percent. We'll, I'm, I'm fine spreading it out. That leaves you 1300 bucks for whatever. That's probably even overkill because really that would be a half a percent anyway at the most um, for just like the ticket to go to something like that. I do. I love the education stuff, A, for the education, but B, for just the relationships i think are Networking. more valuable um yeah. meals and entertainment do you uh <laughs> some business owners buy every single meal on their business card some business owners do it personally where do you stand <laughs> so i mean if i'm out at a job and i go to the gas station to get gas i might get like a water and a snack yeah, but I'm not going to buy every dinner that we go out on. So okay. I'll leave this at uh at that quarter of a percent. Ah, Perfect. I'm going to put it at a half percent. Just to give you, again, just to give you more wiggle room because you'll have a helper and you'll be like, hey, let me buy you lunch. Thanks for helping today. Blah, blah, that blah. Works. Yeah. Um, recruiting this year, you're not really planning on hiring anybody, right? No, no, not at all. Zero that one out. Um, repairs and maintenance, I feel like 2% is good. It, yeah. It's, you're going to have a lot of money where you spend nothing. It gives you 2,600, which is a decent amount of money for shit going wrong. You're probably not going to spend it, but if the Ultima goes down and you just got to freaking pay a thousand bucks to get it back on the road tomorrow, you're going to do it because you got to go make money. So, um, yeah. and then same with the pressure washer, there's 650 bucks in here. If that goes down. And you're like, I don't want to go buy a new $5,000 pressure washer. I'm just going to make this one run for another year. And it's going to okay. cost me X. Um, tool cool. repairs and maintenance in here. The shop supplies, half a percent might be overkill. Like the stuff you need to, for tooling around on equipment. 
six fifty might be a little high. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I don't really know what shop supplies I would have, so I mean, we can definitely drop that down for now. Put it to a four hundred percent. Okay. Again, it's, it's just for like stuff to have in your garage to mess with equipment so that you yeah. don't have to take it in, you know? That makes sense. Um, taxes, license, penalties, permits, that would be like, it's super state dependent on if you have, this This wouldn't be income taxes, this wouldn't be sales taxes, this wouldn't be payroll taxes. Uh, weird example is like our St. Louis location, we have to pay property taxes on our computers and our vacuums. Huh. Just a, it's just a thing in Missouri and St. Louis area that that's what you got to do. So, gotcha. um, like business licenses, penalties and permits are pretty obvious. I don't know if you'd have anything like that that we need to budget for. So now. our yearly business license, or I guess the um, business registration was 130 or 140. And then the city requires a business license, which is like 80 bucks a year, 80 mm -hmm. to 150. Um, but it, they did, they base it off of sales volume. Okay. Let's just, so, it's 330 bucks that we have budgeted for the year. Fine, yeah. I'm going to leave that as is travel at 1%, 1300 bucks basically gets you to two different places, you know, throughout the year, whether it's huge convention and something else or whatever. Um, I think it's just good to like have it in there in case you need it. Cool. And then same thing with travel meals. When you're out and about, you're going to eat. It's going to go on the business. Historically, travel meals, at least in the last five years or four years, his travel meals were 100% tax deductible, whereas meals and entertainment weren't. And now they changed the tax code so that meals and entertainment are 100% tax deductible just as a way to like help restaurants get back on their feet. Okay. Um, we'll still keep them separate if, if we like see that you're somewhere else buying a meal just so we can understand where the money's getting spent but i think it's okay. good to have a little bit in the budget here for that sort of stuff so are you telling oh. me i should buy more meals and entertainment i'm just kidding <laughs> you know uh you didn't hear it from me but uh <laughs> it's good to support the local economy you know help the small yeah. business owner out so so that puts uh variable expenses at 5.4 so that's it if we scroll down actually let's go back up let's just like recap it quick so we said 131,000 in revenue is the goal. That's uh, your goal was 100,000. We're saying like, let's shoot for it. You know, let, like, what do we do if we hit this trajectory and we keep exceeding that 100,000 and, and shooting toward the moon here? We're awesome. just we're just under 20% for cost of goods sold. We are spending so that's an 80% gross margin. We're spending 11% on our marketing. So now we're kind of down by 70%. We've got um, five per five point six percent, but let's just call it five for me trying to do mental math here. Spent okay. on admin, virtual assistant, bookkeeping, accounting, stuff like that. So now we're at sixty five percent of our money is left. We're going to spend another three and a half on fixed costs and another five and a half on variable costs. I'm just going to round that up to say ten percent again because uh, my brain works better if I do that easy math. Yeah. So now we're at we're at 55% of our revenue left. So if I scroll down, holy shit, I got it right. We're at 54.9%. <laughs> so that would mean if you can do 130,000. Now that 55%, that percentage is going to go down if you do less revenue because we have some fixed costs in there that are going to be the same whether you do 90,000 revenue or 130,000 revenue. A gotcha. lot of those costs will be percentage based that they go up and down based on the amount of revenue that you do. But those fixed costs and some of your marketing costs, if it's a thousand bucks a month, you know, whether you do 130,000 or 90,000, the cost per month is still going to be the same for some of that stuff. Um, so this margin, this 55% won't hold true if you just do 90,000 in revenue, then your margin probably goes down to like 45% or something like that because you're gotcha. gonna have, you have money sunk into those fixed costs that will stay the same whether you do a record month or not a record month. Um, but in general, I think a, a good level to be thinking about is 
it's achievable to to shoot for like a 50 percent profit margin for you now okay. if the in this like this is a good connection to make if you had to pay somebody else to go do that work and you had to pay somebody else to do the administrative stuff of running the business you would you want to shoot for 20 percent profit margin in a pressure washing business so okay. Right now we're saying we think we can get 50%. If you scaled it, you would get 20%, which means if you had to pay labor to go out and clean it, you usually pay them around 25% fully loaded. If you had to pay a full-time person to answer the phones and run the office, you'd pay them about 5%. And there, there goes your 30%. So okay. the, the beauty of this is like, just, just realize that your wage, you're doing those things. Your wage is really 30%. And then your owner portion is really the other 20%. Gotcha. Um, and I know we're looking at 55 here. So I'm like using 50 as a good example. Um, but I like understand that this 50, this 50, 55% is two different things. It's the wage that you're earning when you go and do the work. And it's the return that you should get for putting your money at risk to grow a business as an owner. And those are two totally different things and you need to get compensated for both of them. So if we said that uh, 30% of this is for you to do the work, we'd say your wage for being a pressure washer is really 21,000. Like that's, that's what you're making when you go and wash stuff. Just kidding. That's not right. Um, it should be 30% of the 55%. So your wage is a pressure, this makes a lot more sense. So your wage as a pressure washer is really like 40,000 um, bucks. And as the owner of the business, you're gonna get uh, like 20%, we said, and I'm gonna divide that by the 55. I didn't like it. Let me see if I can make it work. There we go. So like the owner, the owner is getting 26,000 bucks. And I know that doesn't add up because I use 30 and 20 instead of, you know, 30 and 25 or whatever the case is. Maybe I could do just because I mathematically can't be that far off and feel good about it. And I do yeah. 32.5 and 22.5. So like, Here's your 70,000 bucks, 72,000 bucks. You, you as a pressure washer going and doing the work and running the business, you're making $42,000 for the work that you're doing. You as the owner of the business, you're making 30,000. And it's okay. just good to recognize those two. Cause if you have to go hire somebody to do the work that you're doing, you're going to be out 42,000. And th this is where a lot of people get trapped is they're like, I'm going to scale this thing. And they go hire somebody. And then they don't really do anything else. And so they, they immediately lose $42,000. Gotcha. You have to pay, you have to pay other people to do that shit if you don't do it. Right. Yeah. So that, that wage that you're earning goes away. And then you as the business owner only make 30,000. And like, that's not enough, right? That's no, not enough. Not at all. Off of. So like in the short term, you're making the 72, but it's, you're really two different people. And eventually if you outsource the labor, which maybe you do, maybe you don't, um, but it's good to mathematically understand how much you need to be making as a business owner. And you might like outsource the labor for the field and then you just move to full-time sales or something like that. And then you're generating that wage as the salesperson and you're converting so many leads and chasing appointments and so forth. And there's a wage that's associated with that. But I just think it's so useful to separate those two things so you don't get in the trap. And you'll see this on Facebook all the time. People be like, I made 72,000 bucks. And it's like, no, you didn't. You made 40, uh, you, you profited 30, but you didn't know that it's two different things that you did here and you didn't like bucket them. And then you hire somebody else and you fall on your face because you yeah. don't realize all your money's gone. Um, I'd be so happy anyway. with 42. That's what I make now. So. <laughs> well, let's get 72. Do I? So let's get 72. And there and you go. We'll, uh, and then and then we'll uh, grow to 100, and then we'll grow to 150. There you go. I like it.
I'm going to stop sharing my screen because I'm even sick of looking at spreadsheet cells and uh, I'm a nerdy <laughs> accountant. So I love it. Well, I'll drink to that, but then again, I'll drink to pretty much anything. So there you go. <laughs> um, that was a lot of math and a lot of spreadsheeting. I'll shoot that to you. Any okay. like uh, any closing thoughts, comments? I know it's like 1030 for you. It's only 930 for me and I'm tired. Yeah, and I'm the one, and I'm the one running the spreadsheet, so I even have something to be awake for. So I appreciate you even hanging in there for that. Um, yeah, man. So uh, I just, you know, I thank you for doing this, and um, anybody that does see this that's new, you know, it's it just start small and just build up, you know, and really do figure out your numbers, know your numbers, and also track track all the people you meet because that's my that's the biggest mistake that I made when I started because if I had those. I think I did 220 jobs last year. If I had all those names and numbers, man, I would have started this year off probably at that $20,000 a month. So definitely. I like it. I like it. Um, I had, okay, let me hit a couple comments here because I did a really shitty job of, I was so nerding out. It's just me being a finance guy. I was just nerding out on my spreadsheet. Uh, Michael Terman had said when we were talking about uniforms, look good you feel good people notice it uh i have i didn't wear it tonight but michael has sent me his gear so i wear his gear when i do bookkeeping beer and bs every once in a while i got the nice. sweatshirt i got the winter hat like that dude's got some good gear um people notice it uh rob anderson jumped on for a little bit sup beer brother um <laughs> what else do we have and then austin joseph douglas says i want dan to be my bookkeeper uh how much does it cost Starts at 150 bucks, and uh, then we can do something like this live if you got the guts, like Adam does, to uh, nerd <laughs> out on, on on bookkeeping on Facebook Live. So, Adam, I nice. appreciate you jumping on, man. That was, it was, you know, I tell my wife this a lot. It was good for me. I don't really care how it was for you. That was good for me. <laughs> I love it, man. No, this is awesome. I I really do appreciate that. So, good stuff. I'll email that over to you, and we'll uh, keep cranking out the books for you. And when you, when you start buying more stuff, you know, we'll be seeing it, but let me know if you've got uh, any questions on the math behind the scenes and we'll, we'll do some dirty work for you. Sounds good. Thank you so much. All right. See you, Adam. Good night, everybody. We'll see you. Uh, go check out uh, Blue Collar Recruiting Facebook page tomorrow, actually. I think Sean Day and I will be live uh, on site in Dallas for an event, and we'll probably do a little Facebook Live tomorrow from Dallas to... Uh, talk about the recruiting market and what the hell is going on there. So go over nice. to that group and check it out. We'll keep uh, sharing some knowledge that we see. Awesome. All right, y'all. Have a good night. Happy Wednesday. See you later.